so. Uh, again, because it's the word of the Buddha, out of respect, I do a Namo Tassa first of all. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samma Sambuddhasa now, the last uh, time we did a sutta class, um, I just uh, already re uh, read out the Anatta doctrine, but I'm just going to read it out again just as a nice introduction to the stuff which is coming afterwards. And also because I, like, I love the Anatta doctrine. And these are the w wonderful similes of Anatta with. Um, uh, which made by the Buddha, which gives it a nice way of understanding it. Are you going to, okay, not ready yet. Going to expand the, expand the, the vision. Okay, well, what you make, what did we do last week, last time? Please, you make the call. If anybody can't see it clearly, please move closer. Okay? Okay, so let's get... Please get closer if you want to see it more clearly. Yes, but if it's bigger here, it means it's smaller online. Anyway, I'm going to start now, because the last time was 10 minutes before we got started. So let's get going. Here we go. The Anatta Doctrine. This is from the Samyutta Nikaya. Suppose that this river Ganges was carrying along a great lump of foam, and a person with good sight would inspect and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void hollow and empty, for what solidity could one find in a mere lump of foam? So too, whatever kind of form, body, there is, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, you inspect and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to you to be void, empty, insubstantial. For what solidity could there be in form? That's the first component of existence. Suppose it were raining and big raindrops are falling. A water bubble arises and bursts on the surface of the water. A person with good sight would inspect and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void, hollow, and momentary. For what permanence could there be in a water bubble? So too, whatever kind of experience there is, and as you know, experiences is the preferred translation which I give to Vedana. Instead of calling it feeling, I prefer saying experience. I think that's more accurate. So a person with, sorry, whatever kind of experience there is, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, you inspect and carefully investigate it and it would appear to you to be void, empty, momentary. For can anything constant be found in experience? A prop of a water bubble. Suppose that in the last month of the hot season, around noon, 
even though this was designed to be understood by those in India, still I think the last months of the warm weather, like here today, around noon, a shimmering mirage appears. A person with good sight would inspect and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void, hollow, and illusory. For what reality could there be in a mirage? So too, whatever kind of perception there is, whether past, future, or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. Oh, is that better? Okay. Far or near, you inspect it and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void, hollow and illusory. For what reality could there be in a mirage? So too, whatever kind of perception there is, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, you inspect and carefully investigate it and it would appear to you to be void, empty, illusory. For what reality could there be in perception? Suppose a person needing hardwood would take a chainsaw and enter a forest. And just a quick point, I know people afterwards, they ask me, it doesn't say chainsaw in the suttas, it just says an ordinary saw. But no one in their right mind would enter a forest to chop down a tree with a little hand saw. Take a chainsaw and enter a forest. There they would see the trunk of a large banana tree, straight, fresh, without a fruit bud core. They would cut it down at the root, cut off the crown, and unroll the coil. As they unroll the coil, they would not find even soft wood, let alone hard wood. A person with good sight would inspect and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void. Appear to them to be void, hollow and without a base. For what basis could there be in the trunk of a banana tree? So too, whatever kind of will there is. My preferred translation for Sankara, the fourth of the five candles. Whatever kind of will there is, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, you inspect it and carefully investigate it. As you investigate them, it appears to you to be void, empty and hollow. For what underlying basis could there be in volition? Suppose that a magician was, would perform a trick at a crossroads. A person with good eyesight would inspect it, ponder it and carefully investigate it. And it would appear to them to be void, hollow and deceptive. For what truth could there be in a magical trick, a magical illusion? So too, whatever kind of consciousness there is, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, whatever kind of consciousness. You inspect and carefully investigate it and it would appear to you to be void and empty and deceptive. For what authenticity could there be in consciousnesses? That was the standard description of the five components of existence, leaving no component out. Whatever kind of consciousness, whatever kind of will, sankara, whatever kind of perception 
uh, sanya, whatever kind of vedana experience, whatever kind of body, whatever kind, a whole lot. There's nothing which is uh, permanent, substantial, some sort of basis in there at all. And now to also emphasize the consequences of this from Samyutta 22, the 39th Sutta. One who seeks pleasure in a body seeks only irritation. One who seeks irritation, I say, is not free from suffering. One who seeks gratification in experiences seeks only disappointment. One who seeks disappointment, I say, is not freed from suffering. One who seeks reality in perception seeks only illusions. And one who seeks for illusions, I say, is not freed from suffering. One who seeks contentment in volition seeks only frustration. One who seeks frustration, I say, is not freed from suffering. And one who seeks eternity in consciousnesses seeks only for the affliction of more rebirth. One who seeks for rebirth, I say, is not freed from suffering. And this is just why we seek pleasure in the body, gratification and experience, some reality in our perceptions. And a contentment, you know, through the exercise of your will, trying to get somewhere and solve problems or eternity in consciousness. Why do people want to be conscious? Sometimes to get to the eternal, unborn, ungrounded, consciousness will last forevermore. That's why I use the translation, eternity in consciousnesses. Seeks only for the affliction of more rebirth. You keep coming back again forever. Well, not forever until you get wise. One who seeks for rebirth, I say, is not free from suffering. And then the, this little page from the Dhammapada. Why this laughter? Why this joy when it's ever burning? Shrouded all about in gloom, won't you look for the light? Look at this attention demanding body. A mass of irritations, constantly needing support, prone to illness, with nothing stable or lasting. The body gets worn out, so fragile, an incubator for disease. When life ends in death, this disappointing body dissolves. And I kind of like that idea. Even when I was young, you look at your body, it is um, demanding. Even when you are fit, it was still demanding. You need a scratch here, you need a piece of food, it's too hot, it's too cold, it needs a drink of water, it needs something. And as you get older, of course, the irritations get more demanding, constantly needing support, you get headaches and migraines and aches here and aches there. It's prone to illness, nothing stable or lasting. Some of you have to wear your masks to try and keep that away. It doesn't work, the mask, you're still going to get sick and you're still going to die. It just puts it off for a little bit longer. And it gets worn out, fragile, an incubator for disease. And when life ends in death, this disappointing body dissolves. And now these are the three warnings. This is from the Anguta in Nikaya. You always, I used to talk about this a lot when I was a lay person, because it was a standard part of Buddhism. We don't say so much these days about this. But my friend, didn't you ever see a man or woman, 80 years of age or more, quite a few people have had their 80th birthday recently, or they're going to have it soon, and frail, sickly, struggling to walk, even with a walking frame, with many a complaint, strength gone with false teeth and white hair or a wig, with wrinkled skin and blotched limbs and forgetful. 
visitors, I don't mind saying this, but last night I had the good opportunity of visiting two of the wonderful supporters of our monastery. That's Ainsley and Barbara in South Perth. Now they've got blotched limbs. They're getting old. Sorry, they've got old. So they need to look after themselves. And when you look at them, you, know, you can see that they're aging, that they're aged. And sometimes get forgetful. My friend, didn't it occur to you, each one of you, intelligent and mature person, I too, each one of you, am subject to old age. I am not exempt from old age. Let me now do good karma while I still can, by body, speech, and mind. But my friend, didn't you ever see a man or a woman sick, moaning, gravely ill, bedridden, incontinent? My friend, didn't occur to you an intelligent and mature person, each one of you? I too am subject to illness, not exempt from illness. Let me now do good come what I still can, by body, speech and mind. But my friend, didn't you ever see among human beings a dead man or a woman in a coffin about to be cremated or buried? My friend, did it not occur to you, an intelligent and mature person, each one of you in this room? I too am subject to death. I am not exempt from death. Let me now do, do good karma while I still can by body, speech, or mind. And this is finishing off the first noble truth of suffering with just a description of samsara. This samsara is without a beginning. A first point is not found of beings roaming and wandering on, blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting. Sometimes they say desire or craving. I prefer the translation wanting because that's more broad and more accurate. What do you think, which is more? The stream of tears that you have wept as you have roamed and wandered on through your many lives, weeping and wailing because of enduring the disagreeable and not getting what you want, this or the water in all the great oceans. For a long time you have experienced grief through the death of a loved one or of a dear friend or the loss of reputation or wealth. As you have experienced this, weeping and wailing because of enduring despair and not getting what you want, the stream of tears that you have wept is more than the water in all the great oceans. Which do you think is more? The streams of blood that you have shed when you were beheaded, as you roamed and wandered on through this long course, this or the water in all the great oceans. For a long time you have been arrested as murders, murderers, burglars, adulterers, and when you are beheaded, the stream of blood that you shed is greater than the water in all the great oceans. For what reason? Because this samsara is without a beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings who, blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting, are journeying through this round of rebirth and death. That's from the... Uh, that's from the... Um, Samyutanikai. Now straight away, the reason I wanted to I just mention that was that some people still say, oh the Buddha never talked about rebirth. You can be a Buddhist without really you know, accepting that he taught rebirth. And that is quite total nonsense. The Buddha always predicated his teachings on the understanding of rebirth, this is not your only life and never will be. 
So people who say, oh, the Buddha never taught rebirth, that's just been added on later on. I can't see how you can maintain such an idea. Even just one person wandering on through their many lives, just one person, blinded by delusion, addicted to wanting, would leave behind a stack of bones, a heap of bones, a mass of bones, as large as Mount Everest, if there was someone to collect them all, and what was collected would not perish. For what reason? Because this samsara is without a beginning. For such a long time, you have experienced suffering, agony and disaster, and swell the cemeteries with your bones from your many lives. It is enough to experience revulsion towards all volitional formations, enough to let go of the cause of more birth, enough to be liberated from samsara. I didn't have quite have the chance to finish it off last time, but anyway, today it was finished off. That's negative, but it shows you just the situation we're in. It's nice to say that's not true or there's another way of looking at it, but that's how the Buddha meant it to be heard. Now, of course, when you make the problem very clear, the next part is the cause of that problem, the origin of suffering. So I'll read, is that okay to carry on now with, without any questions until a bit later? Good. The second noble truth, the origin of suffering. Now this is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It is this wanting. The word in Pali is dhanha. It also means thirst. When you're really thirsty, you have to take a drink. It's something, even if you don't take the drink, you can still feel that tension in you, that wanting. It is this wanting which leads to rebirth. Accompanied by enjoyment and desire, seeking delight, now here, now there. That is the wanting related to the five senses. Wanting to be and wanting not to be. Now the first of those wantings, they call karma tanha. Karma tanha is K long A M A, singular. And I remember just having a lovely discussion with Ajahn Bamali, who just did a little exercise to check every time you have uh, K long A M A, what it means is related to the five senses. Is that all the senses there are? No. We have the sixth sense of the mind but it's the wanting related to those five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, which is leads to rebirth. The joys of the sixth sense, that leads to some of the heaven realms, especially the, the realms of uh, Sudawasa. But from the Sudawasa, automatically, eventually, after a time, you let go of any desires for the sixth sense. But this particular sense here, the five senses, is the craving belonging to that realm, or anything to do with the five senses, that that is what is meant by the karma dhanha. However, there's also some of the other cravings, like bhava dhanha. It's the wanting to be of existence, whether pleasurable or not pleasure, we want to exist. And the Buddha said that's the second cause of the origin of suffering. And the last cause is the wanting not to be, annihilation. And the Buddha said that is like the dog chasing its own tail, trying to bite its tail off. It 
just can't reach it. It's a wanting to annihilate, get rid of something. It's still a wanting. And that's what the wanting is. The origin of wanting. And where does this wanting arise and become established? Wherever in the world there is anything agreeable and pleasurable, there this wanting arises and becomes established. Sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tangibles and mind objects in the world are agreeable and pleasurable. Then there is this wanting arises and becomes established. The six consciousnesses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch and mind, are agreeable and pleasurable and there this wanting arises and becomes established. Experience of the six senses is agreeable and pleasurable and there this wanting arises and becomes established. The perception of sight, sound, smells, taste, touches and mind objects is agreeable and pleasurable and there this wanting arises and becomes established. Will in regard to sight, sound, smell, taste, touches and mind objects is agreeable and pleasurable and there this wanting arises and becomes established. I don't know if you're getting it here but it's not just the pleasure in these things it's just having experience. Yes, we preferred if we could choose to have pleasant experience, but experience in itself is something which we desire, even unpleasant stuff. And perceptions are agreeable and pleasurable, and sometimes we just want different perceptions, stranger perceptions, just to see if we can have experienced that yet. I still can't understand while doing bungee jumping or something is a pleasant experience. But apparently people get off on that. They just want to experience things. And will, even will in itself is pleasurable. Just to do something. Whether you reach your goal or not, we just love to will. There's a pleasure in that. Wanting in itself is pleasurable. It's like we're alive, we're doing something, we're wanting something. Of sights, sounds, smells, taste, touches, the mind objects is agreeable and pleasurable. And there this wanting arises and becomes established. Thinking of sight, sounds, smells, taste, touches, the mind objects is agreeable and pleasurable. And there this wanting arises and becomes established. It's amazing that people actually can perceive thinking to be pleasurable. Unless you have to think too much and then you know it for what it really is. The thinking is nearly always, um, what's the word now? It's, it's untrustworthy. It betrays you. It promises many things, but it never actually uh, gives you what it promises, thinking. Fantasizing about sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches and mind objects is agreeable and pleasurable. And there this wanting arises and becomes established. And that is called the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It's not just an experience of the senses. It's just, uh, and you may have noticed here, we said with all these things here, the six senses, but karma dhanha refers to the five senses. So where does the sixth sense uh, relate? And that's to bhava dhanha and vibhava dhanha, the desire to, to be, to exist. Because to be, to exist, we think that means to perceive, to think, to will, to want. All those things are part of what one understands as being and wanting that being, that is called suffering, a cause of suffering. Depend the origination of all phenomena, of all phenomena, on seeing, on seeing a sight, and the same with the other six senses, you want it if it is pleasing, you try to get rid of it if it is unpleasing. 
You abide with mindfulness and wisdom of the five bodies, five senses, unestablished. With a limited mind, and you do not establish, sorry, you do not understand as it actually is. The liberation of mind and liberation by wisdom were at, were in those deceiving and oppressive states cease without remainder. Engaged as you are in favoring and opposing, whatever experience Vedana you have, whether pleasant or painful or neutral, you delight in that experience. Welcome it and remain holding on to it. As you do so, delight arises in you. Now delight in experience is a fuel. With the fuel, we call it upadana, and upadana literally means adana, as in adina adana, where Ramani, taking what is not given. Upa literally means up, it means taking up. Taking up that Vedana as a fuel. States of existence develop. With states of existence as condition, rebirth, with rebirth as a condition, aging and death, sorrow, sorrow lamentation, pain, negativity and distress come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. What we're saying here is that wanting is putting it in the context of dependent origination. The next little part here, somebody asked me about this, and so I added it in here. A lot of times that people start talking about the Dhamma, is it just in the present moment, here and now? And we have a phrase we use in the description of the Dhamma, sanditiko akaliko ehipasiko opanayiko. Sanditika, what does that word mean? It does not mean here and now. Here is the description of Sanditika. With the five senses as the cause, the source and the basis, the culprit being simply the five senses, presidents quarrel with prime ministers, politicians with each other, priests with imams, businessmen with householders, monks with nuns, parents quarrel with each other and with their children, sibling with sibling and friend with friend, and here in the quarrels, brawls and disputes, they attack each other with abuse, weapons or lawsuits, whereby they incur death, injury or loss. Now this too is a danger in the case of the five senses, a mass of suffering in this very life, the cause being simply the five senses. Again, with the five senses as the cause, people steal, commit fraud, sleep with other people's partners, commit domestic violence, sexually abuse their children, and when they are caught, they are imprisoned and ruined. Now this too is a danger in the case of the five senses, a mass of suffering in this very life, the cause being simply the five senses. So we don't say this is the here and now. It means you can see it in this very life. You know, when you do something wrong, you know, many people you can see going to jail, losing all their wealth, losing their reputations because of all this stuff which they perform, which is bad karma. It doesn't mean in this very moment. It means in this very life. As opposed to something in the future life. Future karma result. Samparayaka. Again, with the five senses as the cause, the source and the basis, the culprit being simply the five senses, people indulge in misconduct of body, speech and mind. Having done so, after death, they reappear in states of misery in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in the hell realm. Now this is a danger in the case of the five senses, a mass of suffering in the life to come, having the five senses as, a core, as its cause, as its source and its basis, the cause being simply the five senses. And those two passages uh, are quoted together because it just shows that one is the antonym 
the opposite of the other. Samparayika is what you can find out in the next life. Sanditika, what you can experience in this very life. I make it clear? Okay. We're coming close to the end of this second noble truth and then we can have some questions. Future is a karma, oh, just a uh, little uh, passage from the Dhammapada. You will not find a spot in the world, not in the sky, not in the ocean, not inside a mountain cave, where you will be free from the results of karma. Is that scary? It doesn't mean just bad karma. Why do always people assume to escape from the karma? Do you want to escape from the good karma you've done? Because <laughs> karma doesn't just mean bad karma. It just means there's all types of karma. Anyway, karma as volition. Volition is karma, I say. For having willed, you act by body, speech or mind. And what is the diversity of karma? Is karma to be experienced in hell realms, or in the animal realms, or in the ghost realms, or in the human realm? And is karma to be experienced in the deva realms? And what is the result of karma? The result of karma, I say, is threefold. To be experienced in this very life, or in the next li life, or in some subsequent life. So sometimes you can experience karma in many lives you know, from the time you actually made that karma. Inheritance of deeds, beings are the owners of their karma, the heirs of their karma. They have karma as their origin, karma as their property, karma as their resort. Whatever karma they do, good or, good or bad, they are, it says. So your inheritance is what you inherit in this life and what you inherit in future lives. You made that. Wherever that karma ripens, it is there that you experience its result, either in this very life, on the next life, or in some subsequent life. There comes a time when the great oceans dry up and evaporate and no longer exist. But still, I say, there is no making an end of suffering for those beings roaming through rebirth and death, blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting. There comes a time when the Himalaya, the king of the mountains, burns up and perishes and no longer exists. But still, I say, there is no making an end of suffering for those beings roaming through rebirth and death, blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting. There comes a time when the planet Earth burns up, turns into cosmic dust, spreading throughout the universe and no longer exists. But still I say there is no making an end of suffering for those beings roaming through rebirth and death, blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting. So, that is the passages relating to the second noble truth, the cause of suffering. Now don't get too disappointed yet because the next noble truth is the cessation of suffering. But, any questions so far? Is it one on the internet it has to be something to do with what we've just been talking about? Okay, good. This one. Yeah. From the UK. So, should you give up enjoying sense pleasures? How do you do so when it is so pleasurable? You see the danger in them. Because sometimes you can see how they're advertised in the campaign which you can see on your internet or TV. If you haven't bought this latest car, then you haven't experienced 
you know, real life yet. Have you, I keep on saying this, seen the Great Wall of China? You haven't lived to do that. Have you got to enjoy all these sense pleasures? And quite frankly, as a monk, you know, when you gave up so many sense pleasures, you thought you were missing out on some things. And eventually these things, they came to you. And a good example of that, I remember being in Thailand as a monk and started thinking about fish and chips. I said, I'm really just you know, missing out on my favorite food. And then, and then, so when I came over here to, to uh, Australia, then I managed to get some hot fish and chips. Now I'd gone to a funeral service, there's no way of making it back into monastery in time. And so I managed to get permission from Ajahn Chakra at the time to go and get some fish and chips on the way back to Bodhinyana Monastery. We got some fish and chips, it was all organized, I got a nice place to buy it from, it's still you know, before midday, and got up to eat it. It was so disappointing. I've been thinking about this for years. And when you actually get it, it's not what the fantasy told me it would be like. And that's the thing about enjoying sense pleasures, thinking about it, planning for it, getting that food on the table right in front of you, that's kind of promising. But when you actually take that sense pleasure, it just vanishes almost immediately. It's nothing like you expected. And I quoted that last Sutta class. Pleasures are like poppy spread. You pluck the flower, the bloom is shed. Or like the snowfall in the river, white for a moment, then gone forever. That's a Scots poet, Robert Burns. It's ephemeral. Give up enjoying sense pleasures. Why do you say that in plural, pleasures? Because as soon as you've got one, you've got to get another. It's endless. I don't know, what would you like to eat now? If I could, if I could wave my magic wand and get you your favorite food. Fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> and if you had fish and chips, it wouldn't be enough, good enough. You know, you want some uh, salt or you want some lemon or something. And you got some lemon that's too sour or something. How demanding are sensory pleasures? Honestly, do they ever satisfy? Yes, Eddie? Uh, I find this a bit, sorry, I'm being, yeah. I'm being honest, okay? Yeah, I find be. this thing is a bit contradictory, you know, okay? One thing, like desire, you know, all these things, okay? Like uh, if you do it excess, excess, you know, bring suffering, yes, you know, okay, yeah. That's also debatable too, okay, yeah. And how does desire bring bad karma? Unless like you have a, like I say, sexual desire, you, you, you hurt some adultery, then that's karma. You can One thing, see, it, yeah, how can... I'm going to interrupt you because you can see that if it's bad karma, very bad karma, certainly it brings bad results. But even ordinary wanting, becomes an addiction, never allows you to be peaceful. And when people in, in indulge in those sensory pleasures, they find it diff very difficult to meditate. There's a simile I haven't said in this particular book, but which is pertinent, the simile of the wet piece of wood. If somebody wants to make a fire, usually with two fire sticks, they get this piece of wood out of the lake or out of the river and they try and rub it with a dry stick to try and make some fire. They can't do that. It's too wet. Or they pick a stick which is away from the river but not too far away. It's still damp. They rub that, they can't find a fire. But if they find a stick a long way from the river and rub that with their fire stick, they can successfully make a flame. And you use that simile, you have to be far away from indulging in sensory pleasures to successfully make a fire. This is actually to get that 
deep meditations which are necessary to see things as they truly are. Mm. Without those deep meditations, one would always feel that there's some sensory pleasure somewhere, something which is worth wanting. But well, after I, a while you find oh. it just gives you frustration. Can I just say, sorry, it's interesting, I jump, I, I want to yeah, ask I jump Brahm, you know, I read in many sources too, you know, it says, the Buddha says, you know, okay, getting the desire, okay, brings suffering, okay, not getting it is also suffering. You know? Correct. So what do we do as human beings, you know, and we, how does the... the, we, the so you um, stop wanting anything. The, sorry? You stop wanting things. Yeah, but it's, it is said the path also, that's a clock, yeah, the path towards enlightenment is the middle way. Ah, does, that, it, does it like, like a, <laughs> sorry. That middle way. And then way. now you have this one is to the extreme, you know, so how no, do we go No, this is exactly that middle path. Huh? That middle path is letting go of karma, sukali, karnu yoga, the five sense pressures, avoiding those and avoiding asceticism, atagelamatanu yoga. That's the middle path. So it's letting go of the five sense pleasures. Just the letting go also like, uh, involves gradually, so you can't just straight away, you, you let go for a newcomer, they'll run away from Buddhism. How old, are you, how old are you now, I'm Eddie? Not, <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll whisper <laughs> to you. <laughs> so how long, no, no, are, you, how long are you gonna take no, no, I, I, no, I don't yourself. understand. It's just like I was just thinking oh, generally, you know. How you don't mind, Ajahn Brahm? I don't mind, you don't mind, mind me I'm, telling I'm you that that's true. excuses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there comes a time when you decide to live so simply, some of you at home, and you're keeping your eight precepts, you're not watching sort of entertainment, you're eating just simply, you're going on retreats. Mm. Why do we have retreats? Because we put you a long way from the river mm. where you can indulge in the senses and get what you want. Mm. So in the end, that wanting starts to fade away. It gets weaker and weaker mm. and weaker. Deep in my heart, I believe in, in this. Yeah. I believe it deep in my heart. I believe in it. Yeah. yeah. But I was just thinking like for, for newer comers, this thing, how do they do, you know? So they because come, through my experience, I went through, as yeah. human beings, we go through a lot of sufferings, and, okay? So, so like recently too, I, I come to a lot of my senses too, you know? Yeah, I, so I, the, the teaching is no doubt true, you know? Yeah, what we do, we start off on a Friday night with opening the door of your heart and two bad bricks and a wall. <laughs> and that gets people sort of interested. But this is a sutta class, word of the Buddha. And so this is for those people who are willing to accept that this is the word of the Buddha, this is how the Buddha taught, out of kindness, compassion, to encourage you to move further away from the stream, to literally dry out, and it gets much easier to meditate. You can sit there and you can become still. And what a beautiful thing that is. Yeah, and I when you that. are still, you can see things as they truly are. Yeah. Yeah, I got it now. Also, the Buddha says, not everybody can, can understand his teaching. Ah, oh, no, no. Yeah. Everybody can, oh. but a lot of people don't. Mm. <laughs> it's a possibility. It's Thank one you. amazing thing to tell each one of you here. It's all possible for you to become fully enlightened. Most of you won't. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, even when you go on the middle path as such, there's still a form of wanting there. That form of wanting decreases. And this is, you've heard me say this many times in meditation, you don't do meditation. You don't want it. You sit there and restrain all the wanting. An amazing thing happens, all the all the stuff which you aspired for and think that wanting is the way to get there, you realize it doesn't get there. All those similes, this is not the word of the Buddha, the word of Ajahn Chah, sitting under a mango tree, perfectly still, just put a hand out and a mango will fall. 
I couldn't understand that when I was a young monk, that was rubbish. But later on, as meditation grew, wisdom grew, what a beautiful teaching that was. When you sit meditation, you don't want anything in the whole world. Really content. Then you start to feel a peace and contentment, which is blissful. And the mind goes into these deep states, away from the world of the five senses, into the world of the mind. You bliss out. You get sort of these pleasures which are far greater than anything that the world can offer you. And this simply happens because you have a bit of trust. When the Buddha said no wanting, let's give it a go. It's radical teachings, I agree with you there. Thank you for answering the questions. That's why it's amazing teachings. So all the wanting when you are sitting there and you're going through the middle path, the body at some point does need to have water. It does need to have some substance at some kind, surely. No, no. that's the amazing okay. thing when you see these gurus and stuff. There was that little kid who was sitting uh, not moving or not taking any drink over in India somewhere for days. Even to some of the monks which I've known sit so still with it. That, that Vietnamese monk over in Sydney sat for eight days, supposed to be teaching a meditation retreat, never drank, never ate anything. It was almost, let's say, like suspended animation and then came out afterwards, after eight days. There's some stuff which is weird, and I'm not just making this up. This is real stuff. So sometimes we think, oh, we've got to get something. The answer, do you? I you, I'm sorry. You, you need to get some things, but do you? How much of the objects of our wanting, what generates that wanting, is really necessary? A lot of it you can put aside, live really simply. So you're saying then, uh, once you hit that middle path then, you can go on for the rest of your time here on earth that way? Yeah, why not? Okay. Until you die, until you die and pass away. Okay, there's a question over here. Ajahn, can there be agreeable things um, and pleasing things, but um, you are not taking it as you, so you don't have wanting? No, even agreeable things. The most agreeable thing, you know, what I ask you to get me for my next birthday, is nothing. In other words, the most agreeable things is just leaving things alone. Sorry? The most agreeable thing is like not wanting anything at all. And again, all those things which you feel are necessary for life, especially like as a monk or as a nun, they come to you. You sit under the Bodhi tree, hold a hand out, and the fish and chips comes in your bowl. It's true, you know. Yeah, go on. So, Ajahn, um, what's left, is it just the second path factor? Second you, path factor? That you live by? Sorry? Yeah, I mean, those, um, those kind of motivations, are, you know, if you're not pursuing uh, sense pleasures or oppressive austerities, do you just follow, you function basically from the second path factor? Second path factor. Is that the right, right motivations? Oh, right, the, the second of the eightfold path. Okay, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just nothing happens. Yeah. And I guess for those to really be empowered, you have to have some quite developed right view. Exactly, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Okay. I, I, very quick. Ten seconds. 10, 9, 8, 
So I'm with you, yeah. The show just came to my mind. The external, ple one thing, external pleasure is only fleeting now. Not if you minus the external thing, like uh, the internal one, you know, is the, you know, the bliss of the internal thing. That is, is more, is much, is, it, that's ultimate. Oh, it's Pledge, much more pleasure. beautiful, but you don't ever reach that through wanting it. That's one of the big problems with some of you have had very deep meditations and blissed out and you get frustrated trying to get it back again. It's almost like it was a cause of future suffering. You had something beautiful, you want it back. It's not that experience was a cause, it's a wanting it is a cause and it takes a long time. Eventually you just don't want anything in the whole world. You let that all go and then you find it comes back to you. The old simile of sitting under the mango tree. You sit perfectly still, open out your hand and then it falls. This is Buddhism. I'm not sort of teaching you any lesser standard than I would teach any monk or nun. That's why you think I'm being strict. You deserve it. <laughs> Out of kindness to you. Okay. And now, okay, this will be the last question because then uh, we can go after the noble yeah. truth, the cessation of suffering. Uh, Ajahn, um, many of us have gone through life there's a lot of suffering about, especially grief, um, yeah, and unpeaceful the dispute with people, and it carry on for a long time, maybe 10, 20 years. So if we have a solution for that, is letting go that unpleasant um, feeling. Yeah. Isn't that is stronger than I'm not eating uh, uh, fish and chip because I feel very strongly because I've gone through a lot of death, um, you know. So I felt. If I can just have ease my mind, don't grab on it, you know, it's, they yes. have left this world, um, what Indeed. we can do, they will want us to have a happy life. So it's within ourselves, we must really take this precious teaching about suffering. Um, if you really understand that, you know, we used to, when we were young, I like to go to a hotel for a buffet, oh, that's lots and lots of food to eat. But now it's like, oh, I can't have this, I've got cholesterol. So um, <laughs> that's a, a very easy solution. So it's now that, oh, take good care of your health. Please have peace of mind. You know, do simple things, come and do volunteer work. That's it. I, I think that's a very strong motivation for us to move on um, to understand the Four Noble Truth. Yes, anyway, yeah. that will be answered in the truth of the cessation of suffering, how, cessation, how suffering is ended. So I'm going to now go on to the third Noble Truth. This is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. It is the remainderless fading away and cessation of that same wanting. Wanting related to the five senses, wanting for existence and wanting not to be. Remainderless fading away and cessation of that same wanting. The giving up and relinquishing of it, freedom from it, never letting it settle enough to grow. And those of you who have um, perceptive enough realize that this is the four ways of letting go. Chaga, Patinisaga, Muti, Analaya. Chaga is often used for generosity like those of you, someone actually, two people this morning did give me fish and chips on the table. That's not what chaga means. That's only a, a small part of chaga. Chaga means also just giving things up, giving up the wanting. This is almost like a first part of wanting, the generosity, when you're letting go of what you, know, you control, what you own, you let that go. You give it away. You have uh, the grief of the past, the bad feelings of the past. Why can't we just give it up? It's a, a, lot, a lot of times it doesn't do it again. 
This is what I've seen with like people in prisons. They've done a, a crime, and but after a while, when they believe that they're that crime, they overly focus on it. It does become something which they repeat afterwards. It's like you know they're a, a thief, they're a thief, they're a murderer, they're a rapist. I've seen many men who have raped, but they're not rapists. They're a person who's raped. A terrible thing to do, but they're more than that. They keep focusing on the pain. The pain remains, and they repeat it. You think, why would a person who's been in jail ever want to do it again? It hurts. You don't get freedom by uh, overly thinking and keeping those bad memories of the past. You, you'd really do let them go. It's like it was another person. Not me, not mine. It was in the past. And of course a big example of that is someone like Angulimala, a serial killer. And the Buddha found him before the police did and he ordained him. And his advice to Angulimala, the wonderful saying, stop! Stop Angulimala. And Angulimala stopped. Stop letting the mind go to the past. Stop any more ill will. And he became fully enlightened. Fully enlightened, which is incredible. That could happen. You can let go so much immediately. And anyway, that's Chaga, relinquishing it, Patinisaka. That literally means like throwing it out, throwing it away, renouncing it, cutting off that connection between you, your sense of self, and the past. It's amazing that some of these deeper teachings, like of non-self, when you penetrate that and really get into it very deeply, you now you realize the problem with the grief, the guilt, revenge, fear of the past, is you, your sense of self, becomes defined by the past. That's who you are. You make yourself that. And when you can actually separate that, cut that link, is that who you really are? Are you really uh, like a, a, you were a former lawyer before. You were, um, what were you before? Each one of you, some of you retired. You, you, you lived in Bangladesh before Mukta. You know, you, what did you do before when you were working? Sorry? Money? Okay. <laughs> but is that really who you are? That was in the past. I was a theoretical physicist. Click. You cut that off. That's not who you are. All the good stuff and bad stuff, whatever you do, you can. Just not connect with that. It means it's sometimes hard to understand you know, who you are because we usually define ourselves by what we did in the past. Are you an old lady? That's in the future, or maybe the present, I'm not sure. But anyway, <laughs> we cut that so that we don't associate with anything. When you see non-self, really see it, that's when you can cut off the past and the future. You've thrown that out. People say, how can you do that? When you see non-self, you don't own anything. Not me, not mine, not herself. Everything you've done in the past. You may not feel you can do it right now, but you can see the possibility and how it's achieved. 
It's also the reason why I've said this before, it's off the subject here, but it's uh, relevant to you because of what's been asked. That when uh, you become a stream winner, so one, you've actually not just entered the path, you achieved that stream winning, then you've seen non-self, which means anything, the bad stuff you've done in the past, you cut it off. You don't need to be reborn in a lower realm ever again, no matter what you've done. It can be done, it is done, and that's how it's done. That's Patty Nisaka. The next one, the freedom from it, freedom from wanting, how can you do that? And that is, are you happy to be here in this hall today? It's a bit of noise, it may be a bit hot, you may find it hard to hear. Are you happy to be here? If you are happy to be here, you feel free. You don't want anything. If you're getting bored and fed up and thinking, when is this going to end? You want something. And then this hall becomes like being in prison. You're not free at all. It doesn't matter if you've got iron bars surrounding you and huge walls and guards patrolling on those walls. If you're not happy to be here, it's a prison. If you're happy to be here, you're free. Freedom is that sense of mind when you're at peace with things. You don't want anything in the whole world, no wanting, you feel free. I'll just do the last one then. We'll just devote the rest of the time to questions. And never letting it settle enough to grow. That was a hard translation for the word analia. And analia is well known in, I should be well known, him alia. Hima alia. Hima means snow, alia means where the snow settles the Himalaya mountains, Meghalaya. Meghalaya, another state in India, that's where the clouds always are. That's Meghalaya. Alaya means where things settle and grow like the snow or like clouds. So Analaya means never allowing any place where things grow. It's like sometimes I call it the Teflon mind. So, and that's also the simile of the onion, which I've often mentioned. When someone urinates on an onion, no, not an onion, a lotus, sorry. When someone urinates on a lotus, the urine just falls right off the lotus, nothing sticks to it, and afterwards the lotus doesn't smell. And you pour some perfume over the lotus, you soak that lotus in perfume, but nothing sticks to the lotus, not even a smidgen sticks to the lotus. Everything in that perfume just disappears. It still smells like a lotus. Nothing sticks to a lotus, which is why it's analia. That whatever comes up into your life, praise or blame, any of the worldly dhammas, happiness and suffering, gain and loss, what's the last of those four pairs? Sorry? Oh yeah, fame and risk, yeah. That is a crazy thing. And even these days, okay, that sometimes I'm well known now, so I have some crazy experiences. Just last night when they were taking me to Ainsley and Barbara's, I mentioned to them about going on a flight to give a, on a conference over in Yogyakarta in Indonesia. So we flew to Bali, first of all, on Garuda Airlines. And I was just sitting in economy class, minding my own business, when one of the flight attendants came past, just to check all the passengers, and stopped and took one look at me, and said, are you Ajahn Brahm? I said, yeah, last time I checked. I actually said that last time I checked. And then she put her hand over her heart. Oh, I must be one of your 
major disciples in Indonesia. I've read all of your books, they're amazing. Oh, it's such a pleasure, to you. you're on my flight. It was really over the top. Burr was there, she saw it. And then anyway, the, one of the problems was that once they served a, a simple breakfast and took everything away, then she came to me again and said, um, please Ajahn Brahm, can you please come up to the front of the galley? I didn't know what she was going to do with me. <laughs> I said, okay. So we went up to the front of the galley and then all the flight attendants were there for a photo shoot. <laughs> Indonesians, that's what they're like. <laughs> and they took one photo after another. And at the time, all the, the, the buttons from the, the clients, you know, the passengers were going beep, 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 beep. They wanted another beer. So one of the flight attendants said, just hold on for five minutes, we're busy at the moment. <laughs> photograph and photograph and photograph. It was crazy. So that is sometimes what that is like. You get harassed on the flight. <laughs> I just want a nice quiet time to meditate, they wouldn't let me. So fame and lack of fame, they'll always come together. Anyway, that is by what's going on? That's not letting anything settle enough to grow. Okay, now it's so we can have questions. So Ananda has the first question. Come on. Thank you, Ajahn. And uh, when you were explaining that freedom from it, which is mutti. Uh, oh yeah. Yes, you you mentioned that want uh, happy to be here, so really wanting to be here. No, <laughs> if it's wanting, you're never happy. Okay, happy. Wanting is future. Yes, okay, happy to be here. Isn't that a small scale of uh, bhavatanha to be here? No, it, remember wanting means this is where you are. You want to be somewhere else. If you're happy to be here. You're content to be here. You're at peace being here. Wanting is always having wanting something more, to be somewhere else, to get more. And if you're happy to be here, you don't want anything in the whole world. <laughs> you can't trick me there, Ananda. <laughs> nice try, though. Nice try. Same question. Um, if I want to come here, it is also wanting, isn't it? If I want to go to a retreat, it is also wanting. Yeah. So how do we differentiate this wanting and that wanting? Yes, okay. So this is being in the world. You, you want to come here. You want to go on a retreat. But once you're here, can you give up that wanting for the hour and a half we're here. Yes. And see what it's like. Yeah. And then all this other stuff, it's always, you know, you, a lot of the stuff you do, you've got no choice. Yeah. It's not that I want to go back to monastery afterwards. If I decided I'm not going to go back, these two monks will be in trouble. And so it is like present moment. What In present want. moment, there cannot be any wanting. Mm. Yeah. You're here. You have to have wanting to get somewhere else or get rid of things. Wanting some pleasure you not already have. My goodness. No more. Okay, there's a questions on here then. Suppose we stop indulging in the senses. Indulging? And then something good comes to us by itself. Can we enjoy it then? You've got no choice. Or should we still refuse to indulge in it? Refusing is wanting. Wanting to get rid of things. When something good comes to us by itself, it's here. Wanting it, not wanting it, it's here. So don't disturb it. Please clarify how we can deepen our practice with this understanding of lessening craving, wanting. 
Those sense restraint guarding the sense through sense restraint, guarding the senses to reduce our craving for the senses, then the mind slowly decre decreases. Yeah, that sense restraint is important. A lot of times, do you do sense restraint? Or does it just happen? You know, this is a weird thing about um, the teachings of the Buddha, but I remember that somebody who brought breakfast to us on Tuesday that I gave her a piece of paper. It was from the Anguttu and Nikaya, the Tens, Sutta number two, I remember it now. And it's where the Buddha has this beautiful sutta, enlightenment is a natural process. You don't have to make will or choose, oh may the next part of the path happen. It happens automatically. The powerful teaching of the Buddha. So check it out if you wish. Anguttu and Nikaya, the tens, sutta number two. Yeah, excellent. Did you have a look at it? It's powerful. You don't do anything. You vanish and it happens all by itself. That's just like Ajahn Chah say, you sit down, open up, it's perfectly still, don't move, open up your hand, a mango will fall. Right into your hand. It's sort of counterintuitive at first. But then again, this is actually how it works. I'm not being a Zen monk, I'm just being a disciple of the Buddha. Question four, we are assuming that reincarnation is true. No, we're not assuming it, we know it's true. It's not a belief, it's a knowledge. In the same way, a knowledge that Serpentine Monastery exists. I can say that's not an assumption, that's the truth. It's the same way you know that reincarnation exists. If reincarnation isn't true, and we only have one lifetime, wouldn't it then make sense to indulge in sense pleasures? It would. But the thing is, it's not true. There is such a thing as rebirth. Otherwise, if you can get away with it, then people try that, to try and get away with it and just, uh, they enjoy themselves and then they just, the police are at the door and you shoot yourself. Saying, okay, I had a good time, I can't get any more good fun. So you shoot yourself, but you find out it doesn't work. You get reborn again. That's what the Buddha said. Rebirth is true. This is the word of the Buddha class. It's not the word of Ajahn Brahm. It's not the word of I don't know, Eckhart Tolle. It's the word, of, the word of the Buddha class. The Buddha certainly, clearly taught rebirth. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a truth, not a belief. Any other questions there? Yeah, go on. Um, Arjun, why we usually say like um, desire from five senses you need to take off rather than not saying six senses mind, why we don't include this thing? Because when we want something, isn't it the mind? Ah, it's maybe the mind has a part in it, but when we want something, rather than the mental state, independent mental state, then that's a different ball game. But it's still wanting to have some sort of existence or get rid of things. It's the other two wantings, Bawa Dhanha and Wibawa Dhanha, get involved. But most of the time, people are just concerned with wanting something to do with the five senses. So, like when people reach to like Nimitta, that's free, is that free from? Totally from the five senses still, or still it, there are some there may be still wanting. just No, the five senses may still be around there somewhere. 
But if it's a really strong nimitta, the five senses become distant from you. In fact, they've mostly just disappeared. Thank you. I hope you're enjoying this and we're not going too deep and too far for you. Oh, yeah. oh Ajahn Brahm, regarding this one thing, you know, yeah. and self-restraint, okay? The one thing uh, leading to suffering, yeah, the Buddha says he's teaching about suffering and ending of suffering, you know. Don't you think for a general practitioner, you know, we, we, sh we should um, experience the, the natural, you know, your instinct, you know, how, you know, the one th experience it, this thing, okay, and get the suffering. You understand? Experience the suffering. Yeah. That's where you learn through the experience, isn't it? Instead of just restraining like that. I think you're correct there. Oh. If you really want to understand what cancer is, mm -hmm. please get cancer first of all. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can't say that. Mm -hmm. Do you know what COVID is like? Mm -hmm. Well, you, how can you know without getting COVID? So please take all your masks off mm. and let's everybody share COVID together. And then once we know what it is, then we'll be much more wise. Mm. But of course, <laughs> because that doesn't make any sense. I'm being sarcastic. In other words, you don't need to follow that intuition when it has not been uh, conditioned, you know, by that wisdom of being a stream winner, at least. So if you can put your hand up and say, yes, I'm a stream winner, and then maybe that intuition you can follow. Otherwise, it may lead you into all sorts of places which you'd rather not be. Mm. All sorts of problems. Mm. It's great intuition, but I'm just going for broke this evening, this afternoon. In other words, just not lessening the Buddha's teachings. I've noticed that as being a monk, sometimes is you know what the Buddha says here, what you know, and sometimes you downplay it. You say, well, yeah, you know, you've got a point there, even though I don't really believe it, so I don't upset you. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> mm. Is that okay? Mm. <laughs> I hope so. Anyway, that's what I said. Okay, anything else? Oh, do we have another question here? No. Yeah, just one question. Okay. Yes? Sir, so until the Four Noble Truths is fully understood, um, we need to walk in the path how important it is sadda or the confidence because until we realize it we are not fully there especially in buddha or the noble teachers yes the confidence is important and that confidence grows with experience and it's sometimes my job as a teacher to actually to teach us honestly non-discriminatory and not teaching down to you. It's very easy to teach down to you. You're only lay people. You, you not, don't need to do jhanas and stuff. <laughs> Later on in life, maybe. Just, I rebelled against that a long time ago. I will teach you as I would teach any other person who comes into this room. As a monk or a nun or anybody. Teach what the Buddha taught as best I possibly can. And if it's a bit too much for you, then maybe you can come to the Friday night talks instead of the Sunday afternoon ones. Then you've been to the retreats we teach in Jhana Grove. That's another place where I don't hold back. And I was surprised. Okay, let's teach Dharma totally, purely. And don't say, well, you know, reincarnation might be, might not be. It is. If you don't want to accept that, fine. You don't need to come. And there's enough people going to Jhana Grove, as you know, of every retreat. Within about five seconds, it, literally, it all fills up. So, that's what I'm teaching. Some people will like it and give some fame. Some people will hate it 
and get sort of the blame, the criticism. Welcome to life. Okay. Okay, it's almost time to finish off now. So now I'll just uh, close off the computer, close off the questions, and we'll bow three times to the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha. And if you have personal questions, please come up afterwards.